Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Managing Editor of Intellectual Capital at Bailey Gifford. Japanese culture is steeped in concepts of beauty. Over a thousand years ago, during the Haiyan period, elite women would powder their faces white, repaint their eyebrows and blacken their teeth. The last bit was seen as beautiful at the time. Today, the Japanese are still obsessed by beauty products and spend more per person on skincare and cosmetics than any country in the world. And Japanese companies are leaders in this field. To discuss this, I'm joined in our Edinburgh studio by Praveen Kumar, manager of the Bailey Gifford Shin Nippon Investment Trust and deputy manager of the Bailey Gifford Japan Trust. But before we start, please remember that as with all investments, your capital's at risk and past performance is not a guide to future returns. Praveen, as an investor, what do you look for in a good skincare company? It's actually no different from what we normally look for in any Japanese company. So the first basic aspect that we look for is the growth opportunity. So what we're looking for are businesses that are exposed to structurally growing markets, markets that can sustain at least five to 10 years worth of really fast growth. And then secondly, we're looking at companies that have a distinct or a differentiated or indeed a unique business model. Now, that might come about as a result of having unique products, or it might come about as a result of a company trying to solve a problem, which of which there are quite a lot in Japan. If you look at the structure of the industry uh, of corporate Japan. Can you give me an example of one company? So one of our recent purchases is a company called Kitano Tatsujin. It's quite a unique business in that it is probably the only company in Japan and perhaps among the very few globally that generates almost all of its sales online. So the products that Kitano Tatsujin sells, you will not find it in any offline store. It's also one of the very few businesses that at least I've come across that has a subscription-based model. So the way it operates is you pay a flat fee each month And in return, you get a box of cosmetics of various types that you can pick and choose. And very cleverly, the quantity in each of those products is just about, you know, lasts you just about a month. So it, you know, it's basically quite a nice, clever way of keeping customers, maintaining customer retention. Uh, And at the same time, because it's recurring revenues, it tends to be quite high margin as well. So the average churn rate for this company, so that's the ratio of people who leave every year, is in the low single digits, which is incredibly low. And in terms of the product itself, they actually have quite a different way of approaching. So rather than developing a product and bombarding customers with, you know, billion dollar of advertising, etc., they've flipped the model on its head. So basically, they've got a very small team who work out depending on, you know, online feedback from customers, reviews, their own research. What are the most common problems that people are really struggling with? And they identify one of those and then try and work out, is there a way that we can solve this based on the technologies and the products that we already have? And one such product, which has become quite a big hit, is what they call as Hyalo Deep Patch. So this is basically hyaluronic acid, which is quite beneficial for the skin. That has become you know, an explosive hit in Japan, not just with women, but interestingly with middle-aged and elderly men as well. The male cosmetics market in Asia is probably bigger than it is, or potentially bigger than it is in the UK and Europe. That's absolutely right. I think a lot of people forget that, you know, as far as beauty and you know, cosmetics are concerned, there is a massive untapped market in the form of the male market. Uh, Traditionally, as you probably know, a lot of the major cosmetics companies globally have focused only on the female market. But I think especially in Asia, where there is a growing recognition of taking pride in one's appearance, and also as a result of the wealth effect. So as, you know, economies grow, as uh, the middle class gets more and more sophisticated and disposable incomes increase, it's a natural progression, not just for the women, but even for the men to start, you know, taking care of themselves, spending a bit more on cosmetics. And typically, what type of product are men buying? So at the moment, because the market itself is so underdeveloped, the range of products available are pretty narrow. So the most common would be things like styling gel. I think South Korea is probably 
at the more advanced end in terms of the cosmetics market for men and there you can look at products like you know skin whitening for example and you also have quite a lot of products related to um, styling gels which are mentioned to the hair care This is what's really interesting the difference between Asian and European consumers I mean chatting to a Japanese friend she was saying in terms of what she was looking for with cosmetics is something that's more natural and healthy whereas in the UK and Europe we might be looking for something that's more sexy and sophisticated That's absolutely right I think the fundamental difference between how say the Japanese and the Koreans view cosmetics versus how the Europeans would view cosmetics is purely down to what they feel the particular cosmetics product is meant to do so if you look at say even in the UK you think about cosmetics it's mainly seen as almost like a beauty product so you know when you go out with your friends or when you're going to a party you know you obviously everyone wants to look good so that's why you know you apply cosmetics of various kinds but in Japan the whole interpre- interpretation of cosmetics is slightly different there people prefer products that actually have a functional aspect to them so people want healthier skin people want you know a solution to some kind of a skin related problem so for them when they think about cosmetics it's less to do with beauty less to do with appearance but more to do with what functionality does this product give me even the way the cosmetics are sold to customers is completely different so in the uk you know you would have a few you know handful of sort of beauty consultants or assistants who would you know offer you to apply some makeup and then look at that and then take a decision in japan it's almost as if you're visiting a gp where there is quite an intense process of trying to understand what is it that you're looking for the beauty consultant would quite often be you know a qualified professional with the appropriate degree and they will try and find out maybe some of your common skin ailments which you may not have you know realized or if you do have a specific condition you're uh, looking for and then once they've done their analysis they'll start you know highlighting a few products that they feel might address uh, those concerns so the level of engagement as well tends to be quite deeper and quite different and the packaging is important as well it's maybe a bit of more of a challenge with a podcast but you've, <laughs> you've brought some examples yeah. here Tell me through them. Yeah, so this first one is it's called Kaiteki Origo. It's basically a fructo oligosaccharide from Kitano Tatsujin which uh, as as I mentioned earlier it's a company that we've recently taken a holding in. And this is basically a popular way of improving your intestine. So you can you know take a spoonful of this mixed in water and it's basically uh, oligosaccharide that's derived from a uh, sugar beet so quite a natural sort of uh, occurring product and that's another quite a fundamental character that Japanese consumers in general look for in products everything has to be natural uh, as far as possible and the companies invest a lot more in R&D and it's exactly well. a lot of these companies tend to be quite backward integrated by that what i mean is in terms of sourcing the raw material in terms of the production everything tends to be quite a seamless supply chain quite often linking back to some of the you know traditional rural prefectures where a lot of the raw materials are grown so it's very much sort of you know in house manufacture there's very little of outsourcing you know to some other part of the world everything is done within japan and what that means is they're able to closely control the quality as well that's one thing that japanese are loath is to compromise on quality just because you know they're able to sell a few more packets of a product that they usually don't do that and as you can see from this packaging you know it's quite comprehensive a lot of information on it and to western consumer looking at it it would be very easy to get a bit overwhelmed and part of the reason is it goes back to japanese culture and japanese tradition where they tend to have a lot of information not just on products uh, but even on sort of their websites uh, for example and just the level of packaging tends to be quite sophisticated with you know very nice little touches and a big reason for that is japanese cosmetics companies in general believe that the packaging is in a way the face of the product 
And you've got something a little bit more unusual, which is a product yeah. that's made from placenta. Exactly. So again, the Japanese aren't afraid of experimenting. And the really interesting thing is because they have this intense focus on all things natural, they have the ability to extend that to some really unusual ingredients and actually you know, do the relevant tests, etc., and come up with really interesting products that actually seem to work, if you believe for consumer feedback. So I've got this product here, which is called Herbal Extra. It's made in Japan by a company called FFID. And it's basically a face mask that's made out of placenta. So do they use human placenta for that, or is it animal placenta? Uh, it's human placenta. And it's all a placenta that's voluntarily donated. And, you know, it's it's been a fairly long-standing sort of a process of sourcing placenta. Have you tried any of these for research purposes, any of these products? Well, if you look at the glow on my skin, you'll probably <laughs> <laughs> get an idea that I have tried some. No, no, I haven't, but my wife has. So I have, you know, a, a willing guinea pig at home. And obviously she speaks quite highly of these. So, yes, so this face mask derived from placenta, that's, again, another very unusual product and one that's actually, you know, very, very popular and common place in Japan. And the other interesting thing is it's not just the Japanese consumer in Japan. I remember I used to live in Singapore and uh, we'd, we'd go to Japan. I went with a cameraman and he'd have Pacific orders from his wife to go to Takashimaya in Tokyo because they couldn't get the uh, blue packaging for something that they bought since Singapore. Right. So there's a lot of demand, isn't there, from Asian tourists outside Japan? That, that's absolutely right. And if you see in recent years, the vast proportion of the inbound tourists coming to Japan are from China. And in general, tourism to Japan has actually been growing year on year for a number of years now. And the numbers have reached you know, well over 20 odd million people every year. And one of the items where, you know, most of the money is spent uh, when tourists come to Japan is cosmetics because there's a growing recognition and a lot of these brands are also well established. But there is an acceptance that Japanese cosmetics usually mean really high quality, functional products, products that in some ways aren't that expensive as well. Uh, You're not paying a massive premium for these kind of products. Uh, And also they're natural so you can be rest assured that, you know, it does what it says on the tin. So if you put all of this together, it's not too difficult to see why demand for cosmetics should remain in a structural uptrend uh, over the next 10, 15 years. Praveen, thanks a lot for joining us. I hope you'll join us again soon on the podcast. Thank you, Malcolm. You can find the podcast on our website at bellygifford.com forward slash podcasts and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and TuneIn. We hope you enjoyed it and please spread the word. And to read more about Praveen's thoughts, check out the autumn edition of Trust magazine. 40 years on from the launch of the iconic Sony Walkman, Praveen looks at Japan's fast growing and disruptive companies of today. You can find his article and more at bellygifford.com forward slash trust. And Pra- Praveen, do you remember the Walkman? Is this something that was as important to your life as mine? I actually have a couple at home. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's kind of orangey, foamy headphones. No, no, the, no, no. So, so the Walkman that I have, I mean, they're pretty ancient. Um, one of them is a Sony Walkman, uh, interestingly. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've lost the headset, but... It, 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 it was uh, one of the uh, sort of earliest gifts that I got uh, on my birthday uh, from my parents. And the way I think about, you know, how Japan has evolved is post the Second World War, you know, you had the first wave of entrepreneurialism where you had companies like Sony, Hitachi, Toshiba, etc. come to the fore. And I think what we're seeing now is probably the, akin to a second wave of uh, entrepreneurial burst in Japan. Being an eternal optimist in Japan, I think, you know, I, I sort of consider this as almost, you know, the second coming of Japan in a way. So there you go. You've got a taste of uh, Praveen's article and trust there that's to come. And many thanks to Lord of the Isles for the music. The track we've used is called Horizon Effect, which was released on permanent vacation. Until next time. Mm-hmm.